Welcome. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Welcome to, what are we calling our show today? We are Community Perspectives on 90, 90, 90 and Zero Stigma. I'm Dazon and I am so excited to be with you all today and to have the conversation that we're going to have with our presenters. I am, like I said, Dazon Dixon Jallo. I am the founder and president of Sister Love Incorporated. We were established in 1989. I have been working in the areas of sexual and reproductive health rights and justice with a very thick lens on HIV since the mid 1980s. I'm also a part of the process of working towards the fast track cities goals of 909090 in my own city in Atlanta and supporting the overall fast track cities initiative as well as the zero stigma campaign and the 909090 targets. We have a fabulous conversation and panel today. I want to introduce to you our speakers and then as they go through you will get more information about them. First up, we'll have Moises Agosto Rosario. And following Moises, we will then hear from Erica Castellanos and, and Sherry Shirkwesha. I'm excited to hear what these folks have to say. I hope you are too. Let's go ahead and get started. First thing I wanna make sure that we're talking about all of these conditions and issues that are impacting key populations in particular, but any and all folks who are most vulnerable and most at risk for HIV and for also at risk or vulnerable to not being able to achieve what's necessary in terms of their own optimum health and the quality of life necessary to sustain and maintain a healthy life living with HIV. There are many intersections that make that a challenge or help facilitate that better in life. Intersectionality is the core of the conversation that we're having today. Intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an attorney and a law professor. She is a scholar at the universities of the California in Los Angeles and Columbia University. She actually is a professor in law on both coasts. The framework of intersectionality is created as a way for us to understand the ways that multiple aspects of our identities intersect, influence one another, and compound to create unique experiences. There are multiple oppressions that occur in our lives. And what we are hoping is that as we respond to these needs, that we have multiple intersectional responses to those intersections that people live with every day. This concept is regularly used to describe the ways that societal privilege and oppression is actually complicated by all the different parts of our identities that are marginalized or privileged in society. So for folks who are most at risk, for example, for HIV, or not having access to HIV care, education and services, it's usually because of gender identity or sexuality or ethnicity or race, or maybe it's about income. Maybe it's about the levels of education, the religious practices, age, anywhere where discrimination, marginalization, exclusion, neglect can happen. These all become barriers to accessing healthcare and to achieving the ultimate in health, out, health outcomes for people living with HIV, which of course is viral suppression and a high quality of life. It also indicates the work that has to be done in order to achieve the larger targets for the communities and for our planet to end the HIV epidemic, which is what we're talking about today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our very first speaker. Moises Agosto Rosario is a longtime treatment advocate and educator for people living with HIV and AIDS. There's all of this great information about Moises here that you can read of his bio. What I wanted to tell you personally is that Moises is my hero. Moises Agosto Rosario, in addition to all of the amazing work that he is currently doing with the National Minority AIDS Council or INMAC in Washington, D.C., he's also a part of the history that has paved the way for all of us to be here as activists, as advocates, as scholars, as researchers, as leaders, as people who are all working in the same movement to end this epidemic. Moises, thank you so much for joining us today. Take it away. Hi, Deison, and thank you for the opportunity to be here 
<clears throat> to have this important conversation in the context of like the update of the 90-90 uh, targets. Um, I would like to um, start beside, um, I, I'm gonna be talking about challenges and opportunities for MSM, but also I wanted to start the conversation highlighting um, some important um, details that we need to take into consideration when we start talking about the targets and about the mixture of results that we have seen in the latest report uh, regarding the different regions and regarding uh, different populations. And, you know, we all know that um, not uh, one size is going to fit all. And uh, we were, um, I mean, we, we know that different results will come out out of the efforts that are happening. Uh, these regions and these uh, in the world, they don't have the same access uh, to funding. Uh, not everybody is at the same level of um, wraparound services, care, prevention. So, so we kind of expected to see that the results in terms of the progress uh, were going to vary. And in some regions, as we see, we have seen rated advance and in other regions we have seen uh, we have concerns about increases on HIV infections and diagnosis uh, in certain groups, uh, what we call key populations. Um, so I wanted to, you know, highlight like you'd see in Eastern Africa and South Africa, we have had major uh, uh, progress in terms of the results of uh, reaching the targets of 1990. But when we look at other regions like Eastern Asia, uh, could you say the other the other slide doesn't? Yes. So when we <clears throat> when we have um, when we see that in regions of the world like uh, we have in Eastern and Southern Africa, we've seen progress regarding. Uh, the implementation of this effort and we have seen that in 2018 and 16 decline since 2010 regarding new infections. Meanwhile when you look at uh, other areas like I said in the beginning you have that we have increases that are bringing great concern because um, these are in new infections and you see it in the regions like Eastern Europe uh, also, we see like a 29% in Central Asia. And in Latin America, we're seeing a 7% of increases. Um, these increases, you know, may be um, barriers and obstacles to reach the targets. And if we don't reach the targets, we will not be able to end the epidemic. Um, also, when you see uh, the number of people with newly uh, on treatment that are on treatment, we have seen some progress every year. Steadily, we have seen an increase, um, reaching like 23.3 million of the 37 million people living with HIV last year. So we've seen some improvement. Um, also, in terms of the death, around um, seven, um, seven, uh, 770,000 people have died of AIDS-related illness, and, and we have seen also a significant reduction uh, from 1.7 million people who died. Um, this is after the peak of the epidemic in 2004. Uh, next one. Next slide. So, I mean, when we, when, when we have this kind of results, we have to um, be very concerned and highlight the needs of key populations that are still facing a great deal of stigma and discrimination. Um, and uh, these are uh, populations that have been marginalized and also vulnerable, and they have always uh, have been confronting issues related to um, no having good access to healthcare. And the underlying uh, structural drivers of inequalities and the barriers to HIV prevention and treatment, in order for us to have some progress, we need to eliminate them and also work harder in terms of, you know, the attitudes that discriminate 
there were people living with AIDS and that at this point, you know, you will think that they are in a better place, but still we have extremely high, uh, high uh, incidence of discrimination to these communities. Um, we see that in different con uh, countries, you have different uh, situations, like for example, in some countries, the criminal laws that become aggressive laws and enforcement and harassment. And, you know, in some of them, we see the violence. These, these continue to push the populations that we are mentioning that are vulnerable to the margins of society. And it's not allowing them to have the basic health care and social services that they need. And like uh, my friend Ariana uh, said here, you know, one thing that is affecting and creating um, all these barriers for these communities is, is a stigma. Uh, something that, you know, even though we've been working so hard, we still see it manifested against these um, people living with HIV and marginalized people. So Ariana said here that the stigma is like air. Uh, you don't see it, but you feel it. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's true, and that's why it's so hard. Uh, one population that uh, we uh, need to discuss um, is the gay men and other men that have sex with men um, and how, you know, we need to um, work with the challenges that present toward these communities. Um, as I mentioned briefly in the uh, previous slides, uh, these communities confront challenges in terms of like discrimination because of them being gay. And also in some countries, which we have seen less countries uh, in the past couple of years that criminalize homosexuality. This create uh, a sense of insecurity for these communities. And also, you know, beside these laws, also with these laws, you see an increase in violence uh, against gay men or men that have sex with men. And this violence uh, prohibit or don't allow this community to freely look for the services that they need or to actually as simple as being themselves and um, uh, uh, being out to the community and, and being able to exchange uh, and teach and you know, build community with other gay men in their area. So they are not able to do that due to those uh, laws, also due to the stigma and the discrimination that still happen in the community is really, really hard for a person um, that feel that it's made feel that this person is not worth living or that this person is not worth to have quality health care or that because you're homosexual or out gay men, there is something wrong with you, which is, you know, absolutely, um, you know, not, not true. And, but this kind of belief People see it, people also assimilate it. And you have to confront not only the stigma in the community as a whole, but also the self-stigma that is created, you know, within the person uh, as they uh, start to believe that what is told about them in terms of not being a worth of healthcare or worth of um, quality of life, um, they start to assimilate it to the, to, into their own core of, self-perception. Um, also, the problems that we see is the socioeconomic status. As we see within the results, a lot of the you know, low-income countries that uh, are part of the efforts of 1990, in some of them, it's, hard, it's been hard to reach or progress on those targets due to uh, socioeconomic uh, problems. I mean, um, these, a lot of these communities also confront issues of not having access uh, to an steady income, or um, they come from a situation of big families and they lack uh, resources, um, not only in their community, but also resources in the way they live. And a lot of time they have to prioritize the things that are important for them to move on in terms of like finances. You know, some people don't have to prioritize food against healthcare, but in a lot of these communities, you know, we, we see this uh, as a reality in the day-to-day -day basis. Also important is to highlight 
what I mentioned about the self-stigma and the psychosocial aspect of, of, of the situation in which this community live, uh, you know, how your community perceive you, it's also so how you learn to perceive yourself. So issues related to psychosocial and counseling, not only for the individual gay men that is either living with HIV or at risk of HIV, uh, but also to their families and their communities is extremely important. Um, we see also the structural drivers of inequalities, you know, that are related to the socioeconomic status, for example, in some other, e other cases, you know, have to do, you know, with the access to normal things that we take for granted um, in the uh, high income countries, like having a home, um, like having a way to move around, uh, and go to your appointments, let's say, uh, having food in your, in your house. Uh, we, we take that for granted, but for a lot of these communities, uh, gay, gaming communities in other low-income countries, these realities are, are very powerful and influence them, their way to access healthcare, HIV prevention and treatment. Um, also, um, as I mentioned, geography, it's, it's an important challenge. Um, for some people, in terms of like local geography, people don't necessarily live in urban areas where they have access to, you know, health care or a clinic or food, you know, in, in some of these, for some of these communities in areas uh, in Africa or, or Latin America or Asia that are rural, um, it's, it's not easy to access the basic things, neither um, it's uh, easy to access Healthcare. So for a lot of this community, it would be important to go and be where they are if we want to make sure um, they are part of uh, getting quality healthcare, HIV treatment, and understanding HIV prevention. Um, also, the lack of community-based responses. One thing that it would be important is that in order to uh, progress and, and be uh, effective in, the, in reducing the incidence of infections and the deaths uh, due to HIV. I think community needs to be involved from the very beginning of any process or any interventions that we do among gay men. And gay men need to be empowered uh, and they need to have the resources and, and being able to have um, a way to organize the community, to build the community, so the provision of services and the advocacy that need to happen could continue and be increased. Uh, also, uh, cost-free access to prevention and care. Uh, when we talked about gay men and any other key population, I think that the effort needs to be patient-centered uh, all around the, the needs around the patient uh, that uh, we want to impact with uh, interventions related to accessing care and treatment. Next one. Next slide, this one. So uh, while we wait for the next slides, we have the uh, opportunities um, that we have. Oh, now we have it. Great. Thank you, this one. Um, so be, uh, following to what the son was talking about in the beginning about the importance of considering intersectionality and you know uh, we need to all the key population uh, in the case of MSM uh, it would be important to when we think about strategizing in opportunities regarding opportunities or interventions you know to help this community move forward it's important to understand that you know, there is all these intersectionalities. Like when in the previous slide, I talked about the challenges and the, the structural barriers um, that these communities face, you know, these, all these factors are, are uh, they have intersections. You know, the person is, is, uh, no, is a gay man, but also is, is a member of the community. Um, it's, uh, you know, there is many identities and, is part of you know the effort of educating the communities, community health educators. So all these identities and like the social determinants of health that we have to work with, um, they intersect. And I think that space of intersection 
it's an important space to look at because sometimes it's where is the space that we don't we don't see what's happening and i think that is important to acknowledge that probably synergy in looking at that space we can be more comprehensive in the way we reach to key populations one aspect that i wanted to highlight is the impact of um, covid 19 um, and and that we should be ready uh, among key population and gay men specifically because you know the the situation that we're living with this new pandemic uh, definitely has uh, shown to have impact among gay the, uh, gay men and other men that have sex with men and and there was a study uh, made in the states uh, I think in, in uh, New York, in which a sample survey of over a thousand gay men uh, and, and bisexual men reporting that COVID pandemic was having an adverse impact on three aspects that are important for um, the well being of the individual, which is their mental health, their economic security, and access to health, health services, uh, in this case, sexual health services. And um, also that this survey, the population that was surveyed, uh, were particularly high the impact among young, um, young gay men ages 15 to 24. So um, one of the, the couple of the results that we saw in this was um, we have among them 70% of the respondents were white, 14% uh, were Latinx, 8.5% were black, and another 6% was marked as multiracial. 12% um, of the whole group was people living with HIV, and there was one person that was identified to be diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, what we learned from this survey, um, going to the next slide, is um, this is a quote uh, from one of the individuals uh, that worked on this survey, and uh, you have the title of it, Characterizing the Impact of COVID on Men Who Have Sex with Men. Um, but what he's saying is that COVID-19 has produced uh, widespread changes uh, to the economic resources, also the social network and how healthcare is provided. Um, and, um, and he's so right about stating that um, it's important to look for evidence and more research that you know, can tell us in more specific details how this disruption of services, disruption of income for some people um, can um, in the short term and long term have a direct impact on men that have sex with men and direct impact in their life but also in the way they access HIV prevention and treatment services. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there were three, three aspects uh, in which these gay men were impacted by COVID. Um, I mentioned the mental and emotional health and 73% of them reported having increased levels of anxiety and um, also like 56% of them reported uh, had decreased uh, connection to friends. And we know that for gay men, that connection to support family uh, support from their circle of friends uh, is very important uh, for this community and having uh, not having access to that connection uh, can create anxiety and, and most of all isolation and, and isolation as we know is it's, it's very dangerous for people uh, in terms of like uh, keeping them healthy mentally but also physically. Also, we saw that sexual behaviors, uh, when the people in the survey asked uh, to use the, the app to connect with other men, 49% uh, of all respondents had decreased uh, meeting potential partners for, for uh, sex uh, potential partner in person, uh, while 45% reported no change in their behavior, meaning that while people were in the lockdown, they still were connecting with other gay men through the apps. Uh, and engaging in sexual activities. Uh, the, the last one, which is very important as well, is when it came to substance use 
we saw that 10% of all participants had an increase in recre recreational drugs, use of recreational drugs, while um, the lockdowns of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that 18% of the men up to the age of 24 reported also increase on drug use, and about 31% of those were 15 to 24 year old, and nearly 25% of men over 25 reported drinking more alcohol. So vulnerable communities until this situation, um, all we have seen that they are more prone to uh, increase uh, use of recreational drugs, also as well uh, use alcohol, drinking alcohol, which make them more vulnerable and uh, could put in risk uh, their sexual uh, behavior in terms of uh, protect themselves against HIV infection. Next slide. Um, so here also we saw that impacted how they access, had access to HIV and uh, sexually transmitting infection services. And despite, um, despite the social distancing, we saw that one third of people attempted to seek uh, testing for HIV and other STIs and that um, a high proportion of them reported had challenges in terms of like getting an appointment in these clinics uh, due to you know, all the restrictions imposed by COVID-19. Also among those that were living with HIV, they reported that they had problems accessing uh, or maintaining their antiretroviral therapy, which we know it's very dangerous uh, because we want to see people living with HIV to stay uh, virally suppressed. Uh, also, we saw uh, that uh, in terms of having their appointments uh, and see their care providers, um, the, due to the restrictions, um, they had some, some, some challenges in terms of seeing their provider and follow up with their appointments. Um, also, this, this study concluded that um, HIV prevention must be prepared to actively meet um, what this study is telling us is that we need to be ready to understand that with this new normal of COVID-19, we have to reconfigure the way we serve uh, the population of gay men uh, and see how we more effectively under the new circumstances uh, provide prevention and care uh, for them. Next one. As I said, we need to be prepared uh, for hair care's new normal. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And now we go back to the sun. Thank you so very much. Moises, that was fantastic. It was interestingly how I would want to come in on this piece is to acknowledge that when we're talking about intersectionality, we actually can recognize and also acknowledge that, and I'll, I'll go back to this one for now, because when we're preparing for the healthcare is new normal, but when we're talking about a lot of these issues with particularly with key populations and the, the intersectionality of their challenges and their opportunities, it actually erases a lot of the differentiation between the different populations. And what I mean by that is if we were talking about young or adolescent girls and young women in sub-Saharan Africa, there are so many parallels and so many similarities once you start talking about all of the other intersections that either impede or help facilitate access to care or achieving optimal health outcomes. And of course, addressing some of those key issues that are happening every day. And even inside the COVID response, I think it's the same thing. I would be interested to see, and maybe I could ask you this, was there in the study any questions or any conversations with the uh, men around intimate partner violence, around gender-based violence for our trans family uh, or for uh, with whichever uh, identity they take on? Has there been an uptake or an increase, if you will, in the amounts of violence that have also been experienced in the community as a result of the increases around isolation and COVID-19 response? 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't see it in this study in particular, but you know, in discussions with the community uh, regarding, uh, you know, other, uh, we have seen a reporting of increase of domestic violence, even among men that have sex with men. Uh, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, when these issues are not addressed and you uh, position these, com these individuals in a situation in which they have to be in a daily basis, um, let's say sharing a space with that person that uh, is violent, that person that is not supporting, um, it's, it's, you know, that increase the, the possibility of that violence to, to, to be of great danger uh, in terms of like, you know, you have to people locked down in a place and in, in a situation in which they don't have a place to go to look for help. Um, they don't have the space to make a phone call in some cases to get some counseling or, or to call the police if the case is. Um, and they have the fear of not going out because you don't want to get infected you know, uh, set them up uh, for a very toxic environment at home where you're supposed to be safe. Yes, yes. And that's exactly what I mean when I'm saying that the similarities of the, co or the commonalities of the experiences are absolutely prevalent and clear as day, if you will. Again, I want to thank you, Moises uh, Augusto Rosario, for a fantastic uh, overview. Uh, and conversation about intersectionality in the in achieving the 9090 targets and addressing stigma uh, in an effort to get to the zero stigma in the campaign that's before us as well as dealing head on with what's going on with gay men uh, around HIV and around living with HIV as well as uh, prevention issues with regard to the current COVID-19 crisis. Thank you so very much. Absolutely. Next we're going to Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Erica Castellanos. Erica is a transgender activist originally from Belize and now living in the Netherlands. She studied social work at the University of Belize and LGBT health research at the University of Pittsburgh. And she is currently studying international relations and diplomacy. Erica, take it away. Thank you very much, moderator, and I'm happy to be speaking today about, you know, the 1990 targets and how it relates to stigma and discrimination. And I will be talking particularly from the perspective of transgender persons. So most of us know what the 1990 targets are, but in, just in case, I'm going to go briefly through it. So, you know, it's 90% of people living with HIV know their status, 90% of those who know their status are receiving antiretroviral therapy and 90% of those taking medication have undetectable viral loads. And lately there has been a lot of conversations, uh, many conversations and it's increasing over the year and a lot of advocacy is happening about the FORT90. And yeah, what is the FORT90? You might ask yourself. So what is the FORT90? The FORT90 is about the perceived quality of life. So, uh, it's, it's, it's not a first step, but rather it is something that applies to the whole and for each of the 90 targets. So it, it, it builds up, but it's about quality of life. So what does it mean for people living with HIV? What does it mean for me as a transgender woman living with HIV when I hear quality of life? I know, you know, everyone has a different definition of what quality of life is for him or for her or for them. But in general, when we talk about the FORT90 and how we want to pursue the FORT90, where 90% of us living with HIV have a good health-related quality of life, we are talking about having a, you know, a good outcome in life, planning for the future, enjoying uh, good health overall, even with comorbidities. You know, live, life with HIV has always presented unique challenges. And it is not the same now as it was 20, 25 years ago. When I was diagnosed with HIV in 1995, you know, I was told, yeah, you have six months life expectancy. There was no treatment in my country at that time where I was living. And then, you know, new treatment came. There was new um, innovations. I had some hope. 
and I'm here now. But what does it mean to me 25 years later to be living with HIV, you know? We, as persons living with HIV, we age 5 to 14 years faster than people without HIV. So what does it mean when you are living long term? This translates into early onset of chronic diseases, of chronic conditions. You know, additionally, uh, we age, we have HIV, we take antiretroviral te therapy that has side effects. There are risk of cardiovascular uh, problems, kidney failure, liver disease, bone loss, and many certain cancers. So all about this, we need to take it and look at it in a holistic way and look how does it affect our quality of life. So along with all these medical concerns, we often continue to face many other challenges that are institutional from society that make us vulnerable to HIV in the first place, that limit our access to health, uh, uh, that limit our health literacy, that limit our fulfillment of our human rights. The lack of access to care, the stigma related to our sexuality, to our sexual identity, to living with HIV, and also issues around chemical dependency all play a role. That is the reason why the 490 holds so much potential for us living with HIV, because it looks at all these issues and all, you know, the, the other factors. Apart from living with HIV, I also have to worry about other illnesses, about what does it mean to live longer with HIV. You know, now with HIV, you know, we have treatment, we live longer, but that comes also at a cost. And that is what we're talking about when we say the 490. So what are those challenges and factors that affect our quality of life? How we feel good with ourselves, the outcome for our future, the satisfaction that we have with our treatment, with our life, with our health overall. And how does it affect our mental well-being and experiences of HIV-related discrimination? So, if we look at all of this and we think, okay, so how does this apply and how this relates specifically to transgender people? We know that HIV prevalence among transgender people, particularly there's a lot of research about transgender women, is disproportional when compared to the general population in various countries. And stigma and discriminations based on gender identity has frequently been associated with never will vulnerability to HIV AIDS. So what happens, you know, as a transgender person, first of all, like if we're talking for many regions, and I will talk, let's say, from the perspective of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, very few countries in the region have gender identity laws. That means that I have issues opening a bank account because they ask me for legal documents to be able to open a bank account. I have issues about accessing higher education. So many of us don't have access to education. We cannot even go to university or even to college. So th there's a lot of issues that impede social barriers that impede people uh, and, and you know make people more vulnerable. Many of us have to do uh, sex work as a survival strategy because there's nothing else we can do. We are not prepared. Uh, we didn't receive an education. There's not a lot of economic opportunities. Uh, it's not easy to get a job. Uh, people discriminate uh, 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 transgender people. So what is there else to do if you want to survive in this world? Many of us go into trans uh, 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 sex work as a survival strategy and that's okay and sex work is work and it's respectable but uh it, it would be good if it's persons you know choosing and not having to be forced on that direction so that already makes us vulnerable to hiv and that's because of the whole stigma and discrimination and when we're talking about quality of life believe me if you don't have uh, income, if you cannot have property, if you cannot have bank account that when you get sick, you have money to go and buy an aspirin, that is not quality of life. That is definitely uh, a substandard uh, kind of quality of life. And what we want to achieve is the most. So we can say that eradicating stigma and discrimination will help us achieve quality of life. 
uh, because it's 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 like a entry point for us to have the opportunity to be able to develop and be able to access health and be able to access job opportunities. So this is the world we want. We want to eradicate stigma and discrimination so that we are able to enjoy the world fully, enjoy our human rights. When this is done, then we can start thinking about, you know, having a better future, looking at issues about, you know, planning our lives. But it's essential that we take care of ourselves, that we enjoy the, our human rights. Access to medication, Yes, we live longer, but living longer doesn't mean it's a happy life. To live longer and enjoy your life, you need to enjoy your human rights. You need to be able to fulfill your most basic need, access to housing, to water, and to have a, a job and a dignity away, and to be able to feel free to move in your country. You know, there is a high rate of murder for transgender people in the world, and this definitely needs to stop. I think that if we're going to talk about the fourth 90, there is no way we cannot talk about stigma and discrimination. And my recommendation is that we start prioritizing the eradication of stigma and discrimination if we really want to have equity around the world, around quality of life for all people, particularly for key populations that are criminalized in many countries, who are sentenced to death, who are sentenced to years in prisons because who they are and who they love. So it's time to make a difference and we need to tackle this from the go, which is we can start first by tackling stigma and discrimination. Thank you. And I wanna thank Erica for a really, really intriguing and uh, comprehensive conversation around issues that are impacting the ability and the agency of transgender activists who are engaged in addressing achieving the 90-90-90 targets as well as dealing with stigma, the co-experiences of stigma with regard to HIV, people of color, people from the, golden, from the global south, as well as people who are living the transgender experience. Erica, that was fantastic. Thank you so very much. And next we're going to lead into our third and final, but certainly not least speaker of this uh, session today, and that's Miss Sherry Shirquesha. Sherry has been with Project X in Singapore for five years, where she's advocating and educating for sex workers. She started as a sex worker in her 20s, and she now bridges the community with access to justice, to sexual health, to testing, and to information and all forms of assistance while folks are still in the sex industry. Sherry, it is our pleasure to welcome you to this panel all the way from Singapore. Take it away. Hi everyone from Singapore. I'm Sherry, a Malay Muslim transgender sex worker and also the human rights defender for Project X. Project X are the only non-governmental organization in Singapore. They've been around for 12 years now and we're here to advocate advocate for sex workers' rights. Allow me to put it out there that there are overlapping reasons for how and why women caught into the sex industry. We stand against human and sex trafficking and that women are free to make their own choice in life and take charge of it, take charge in it. With this presentation, you will see the depth of impact for sex workers during COVID-19 pandemic. While there are assistance provided, marginalized communities still fall off the radar, pushing them further underground. Who is capable of making change and how? What does the future hold for this moment? From here onwards, any presentation of statistics, anecdotes, and etc. that is represented comes from sex workers and reach out to those who are doing sex work voluntarily. Based on studies research questionnaire, there are an estimated 10,000 sex workers in Singapore. Each year, Project X reaches up to 4,100 sex workers in person and over 1,000 online based sex workers. As we can see here, the various from entertainment workers are licensed sex workers and also licensed sex workers. With the safety measure put in place in hope to decrease human contact, Singapore government has instructed the closure of the 
favorite outlet, bar, club, and even bottle since March 26. For sex tokens, they are only making earnings only based on their clients each day. Do these women have enough savings to tie them over this period? I hereby praise the effort made by the government to support the citizens. Those who lose their job or income loss can apply for Singapore support grants, which gives out monthly cash grants of Singapore dollar 5800 equivalent to 359 and up to 574 USD over a period of three months. The support for self-employed person grants 3000 equivalent to 2154 USD over three quarters of the year. Unfortunately, sex workers are not eligible or if not rejected, as they don't fall under the formal employment and pay taxes. They don't have the document needed to support the application, which make it even harder if they have to disclose their occupation as sex worker, as this put them at risk and or discriminated them. When they Sex workers were disappointed over the fact that they are not eligible for grants due to the nature of the work. This is an example of what I would call inequity. As a presenter of Project X, I'm proud to share that we have introduced three initiatives as an urgent substitute of the government for the citizens. We have here, we are still here for you initiative. We also have the food delivery and lastly, the emergency safety net. I will focus more on the emergency safety net, which started in April and up to present timing. This program aims to help sex and employment workers in Singapore with the emergency needs during COVID-19 and circuit breaker period. All these initiatives could only be possible with the generosity of almost $350 as they have raised $63,330 and to a total of, of more than 150 sex workers being assisted. Our service do not only limit to Singaporean but also other nationalities and the type of sex work they do. It's important to recognize each unique, unique needs of the group so as to assist them at our fullest capability. As you can see here, we are almost into half population going to Singaporean and also non Singaporean. And if I can just quickly run through the unique needs of Singapore, would be the difficulties in receiving government schemes and grants and also the lack of support due to independence. As for the uh, not Singapore, the migrant sex workers in Singapore, their difficulties start from going back to the country to pay rent for in Singapore and also sending money to support their families in their hometown. A breakdown percentage of the recipients, as you can see here, cisgender female, cisgender male, and also transgender female. For both cis and trans female recipients, they either have elderly and ill parents or children. During their challenges has inspired us on how empowered they are carrying all the responsibility over their shoulders. As you can see here, so for the amount of sickness that we know that are the recipients of the emergency safety net program, 65% of them are on work permit and long term and on long term pass holders. At 54.3 are Singapore's NPR. As for the six gender male sex worker, four in total. Two Singapore and two long term pass holders. As for the trans and female, we have 16 in total, all Singaporean. We have categorized the, the top and common challenges among sex workers in Singapore, rent and household bills. Many live in rented flats and are struggling with paying off utility bills. Medical costs, inability to pay for medical bills for themselves or any dependents, especially for non local who have no access to medical aid. Food in inability to afford regular nutritious meals for themselves and their dependents. As you can see here, our emergency safety net program has covered the areas of medical bills, food, rent, and others. With all in total, we have given up to 8,200 that are in need. Okay, yeah, uh, here I'm presenting to you a story for the applicant. Elizabeth, a transgender female Singaporean. 
eligible for independent transhuman from the age of 80 and has been doing uh, sex work for 25 years now. And since the business has been created in recent years, Elizabeth began to find herself in increasingly difficult financial situation. She is not eligible to receive an income supplement scheme by the government as there was no, there was no contribution to her medical scheme. Now we said, losing almost 3k payout. Project S has created a personal fundraising campaign for her to raise funds for uh, outstanding medical and receive contribution. Another story will be from Margaret's worker. She, she struggles, her struggles also include the absence of emotional support from the family and loved one. And having lost her entire income, Jessica has not only lost her ability to support aging parents financially, <clears throat> but she has to rely on her own savings to sustain herself. For Jess again has reached out with Jessica and has been elevating her ways over basic statistics by providing daily food groceries, grocery vouchers, and prepaid phone cards. With all in track and their financial needs has been tackled, there is still another concern that is left on the shelf. We want to highlight the need to look into their health concerns and see them worse if not overlap since the closure of sex worker friendly services for a few months now. Department of STI Control is a heavily subsidized clinic that conducts sexual health testing and treatment. Ukachaka is a community based non profit organization that provides counseling for LGBTQ plus individuals. Singapore has moved to phase two whereby rules on social gathering has been loosened up. However, situation still remains gloom for the community as the chances of operating will only happen in phase three. It is not in our practice to rescue or remove women from the industry, even at bad times like this. We believe in providing them assistance and support, respecting their choice. While there are other options to, to do sex work, there is also the risk to consider some of the women we talk to express their fear of doing online sex work since there is an increased policy on fight activity online. The restriction and concerns to move online or another employment may lead them to risky behavior and fall for financial blackmail so as to make ends meet. To end this presentation, I would like to raise a element. I would like to raise a recommendation for the people of power and control. Government need to reach out to sex worker of the, out of the formal economy by increasing sex worker access to government based outreach health and social services to protect them from COVID 19, provide financial support to sex worker, provide part time employment in a temple, and develop and provide educational resource on safer sex in the context of COVID 19. With this, thank you for attending my presentation and this is any question you may reach out to me by the contact info. Thank you. You can see, as I was saying before, that once we enter into the conversation around intersectionalities and all of the different things that impact us as we're addressing how to achieve the major global targets of 90-90-90 to get closer, if not all the way, to the end of the epidemic, but that addressing st stigma and bringing that to the minimal level possible so that as many people can be open, can participate, and can actually help us all achieve the end of the epidemic because they are achieving quality of life as well as viral suppression and prevention in their own lives. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you again for joining us today. I want to thank our panelists, Moises and Sherry and Erica. I want to also thank IPAC and UNAIDS and ITPC for sponsoring this session and for sponsoring this pre-conference. It's been my pleasure to be your moderator today. I am Dazon. We are the community responding to the 90-90-90 targets, zero stigma, and the intersections that help us achieve the end of HIV epidemic. Enjoy the rest of your conference.